Hi, good morning, everybody, and thanks for giving me the time and opportunity to, to talk to you. My personal epiphany uh, when it comes to solar, I had in 2008. Uh, at that time, I was about 17 years into a semiconductor, and uh, I was exposed the first time to, to uh, photovoltaic, and uh, my epiphany was that, whoa, this is just another semiconductor device. Now, that might sound profound for most of you in the room. Uh, for me, it was a new key learning, and I've seen firsthand what semiconductor did with integrated circuits in those 17 years to computing and to communication. And uh, for me, the, the epiphany was, well, this is going to be the only mature form of energy that is following something like a Moore's law. Now, unfortunately, it's not exactly Moore's law. The, the gradient is not as steep. But nevertheless, it's an exponential function. And I think that's one of the reasons why we keep underestimating what's happening with uh, PV. And uh, one of my theses on, on this presentation is to talk about uh, that dynamics and, and uh, to help uh, make a message on, on us to prepare for a exponential future. Before I start there, please allow me a, a brief um, uh, uh, introduction uh, of the company. Uh, so you can put the statements a little bit into perspective for California-based company. Uh, after the epiphany in 2008, I basically started 8-Minute Energy, put my uh, money where my mouth was. And uh, unique about 8-Minute Energy today is uh, we developed about 1,500 megawatts of uh, projects here in California. Half is operational, the other half is uh, under construction, will be operational over the next few years. Um, and we are developing another 5,500 megawatt of new projects in California and in other parts of the United States. Uh, and companies that are developing portfolios in those sizes are usually large companies. They're usually 10x larger than, than we are. Uh, we're also privately owned. Uh, my business partner, Tom Buttenbach, and my, myself are the owners of the company. So that's unique, and that's why we're calling us, ourselves the uh, nation's largest independent solar developer. A couple of notable projects uh, we uh, developed. We started development of uh, Mount Signal in 2009, and uh, in three phases. It's an 800 megawatt project, one of the largest in, in the world. Uh, we also developed uh, three phases of Springbok. Uh, second phase went into operation October last year, and it's the first one where solar has a lower price than natural gas. Once the third phase of Springbok is ready, then Springbok 1, 2, 3 will develop or will provide about 10% of the power as solar to the city of Los Angeles. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, semiconductor technology. This is a, a, a chart compiled by the members of the Global Alliance for Solar, uh, published recently, and uh, very excited to see a new learning chart, an updated one. Um, interesting is, uh, I think for those who have been around, in the earlier days, prior to 2008, there was a, uh, a, even an increase in, in prices mostly based on the, on the structural deficit of silicon feedstock supply and demand. Basically, the silicon feedstock industry got surprised uh, when in 2002 uh, Germany started the EEG. Um, the other f interesting phase is between 2012 and 2015, if you look at those blue dots, there was not much of an uh, efficiency increase. There was a little bit of a price decrease, but uh, it was all relatively modest, uh, and that's a testament to Basically, until 2009, yet mostly Western industries uh, as a manufacturing base for PV. Uh, the Asian companies started to ramp up in 2009, 10, and 11. And uh, all they did in the last, until 2015, was basically increase the production, but there was not much uh, of R&D. In fact, uh, if I compare uh, a semiconductor company for integrated circuits, I think like in 2008, with a billion dollar and, and one with a billion dollar in module, they're about 9x larger R&D departments. That tells you about uh, the depth of R&D on uh, integrated circuits relative to, to R&D in, in, in modules. And that's why we have seen 5 watt per module increases from 2012 to 2015. Good news is that now um, a lot of the module vendors recognize cap they cannot just continue to expand capacity. They need to do something about it. So. In the past years, we had in, in solar, we had basically the choice between a uh, 72-cell multi-crystalline module or a first solar module. Moving forward, we, we see that deployment of uh, N-type is happening. We, we see heterojunction coming. We see bifacials coming. Um, mono is likely overtaking multi. So there's a lot of uh, new technology coming into the market. And new is relative because this has been around for a long time. It just has not 
had enough traction in the market and, and we see now that the module vendors will uh, differentiate themselves. If we step back and look at the, the, the manufacturing itself and again compare it to semiconductor, um, to me a, a module looks like a memory component and uh, a memory component in, in, the, in the 80s, there were about 300 companies. Today, there are less than 10. We have today about 200 companies and the R&D in, in solar is spread around among those 200 companies. There's no reason why we need more than 10. And the question is just how many boom and bust cycles it will require in the module industry until we are at, at, uh, at about 10-ish um, manufacturers of, of modules. But uh, the momentum is continuing to increase. I personally believe that the majority, the manufacturing majority of a module is where integrated circuits have been in the mid-90s. That means there's a lot of head, headroom uh, in, in PV and we should plan for that. So we've, I don't think we'll reach a plateau in terms of the uh, decreasing costs. And um, this is another chart that the Global Solar Alliance uh, recently published. Uh, it's part of the same article. I found it quite interesting. This is the historical deployment of uh, PV. We're uh, at that point, we we're about at 250 uh, uh, terawatt. And if you look at the projections that the IEA did back in 2000, Two. This is where uh, the forecast was. It was the forecast eight years later. Forecast in 2012 and the forecast in 2015. And you know, not to pound on the IEA, this is pretty much the conventional wisdom in our industry. We, we just don't recognize this is an exponential technology and the deployment usually happens much faster than most of us believe. Let's talk a little bit about how PV stacks up against other resources. This is a, a chart from Lazard. Uh, and you can see here solar is already among the second lowest. Uh, over the next five years, the expectation of the market is that will uh, be lower than wind uh, in absolute price. In value, we are already lower than, it's, uh, in value, we are already higher because a megawatt during the daytime is of higher value than a megawatt at, at night, obviously, or, or late up in, in the early morning hours. Uh, but solar has a steeper learning curve uh, or, or faster cost degradations than, than wind, and that's why we believe uh, over the next five years there will be a crossover between wind and, and solar. Good news, though, is both of these renewable energy resources continue to decline, and that's, I think, the, the good news for the consumer. Uh, so we are already lower than combined gas cycles. We're certainly lower than, than coal. The utility of Detroit recently published a report where they said if they were to build a new coal-fired power plant, they would need 13 0.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So, you know, it doesn't matter what coal does, what, what Trump does, or coal in my mind is, is, is dead. So whenever we talk about uh, solar and the price of solar, obviously the next question is subsidies. Uh, it's important to, to know, uh, this is a, a work that has been done by DBL investors in 2010. They basically aggregated all the subsidies for the different resources that are deployed in the US. Key takeaway is that the majority of the subsidies have been spent on oil and gas. And even today, oil and gas get more subsidies than, than renewables. So uh, it's, you know, we might feel bad about receiving 30% ITC and 10% makers, but we should recognize a resource that, uh, like crude oil that has managed to make money since Rockefeller was in business in, in, in 1870, shouldn't receive any, any subsidies anymore. Plus, if you look at India, which has a less distorted picture because they don't really pay subsidies for energy. The price of, of coal is between 3.5 and 4. Point, sorry, 3.5 and 4.8 rupees. The most recent bits in solar came in between 2.6 and 2.9 rupees. So in a market with less price distortions on subsidies, the solar is already lower than coal. And that's why China is the largest uh, installer of solar. That's why India's gonna be one of the largest markets and uh, I think that's an encouraging sign and we, we should remember uh, that and, and not be distracted by some noise that the fossil fuel guys are throwing at us. Um, I asked myself la in June last year, I was reading on a Saturday afternoon about solar and I asked myself a question that popped to my mind, which is how expensive would it be if we were to power 250 million cars and light trucks in the United States with PV? So I ran a spreadsheet for the next five hours and the number surprised me. It's about a trillion dollar. Well, you might think that's a, a large amount, a trillion dollar. Well, that gives you fuel for 250 million cars in the United States for 30 to 35 years. 
The next question we ask ourselves, hmm, when will this actually happen, this transition? And so we looked at the researchers and did these were the forecasts. That reminded me when back at Intel in 2000, we looked at the question, how large will the smartphone market be since we developed a processor for microprocessors and uh, uh, for, for smartphones. And back then the mobile phone market was a billion units a year. The forecast for smartphone market will be between 30 million and 150 million. And then came 2007 with Apple and then Android was deployed with the same capability on lower bill of material. And, and the, the, the voice only vendor called Nokia shipping 400 million units in 2006 was sold for cents on the dollar eight years later. And nobody in our industry, including ourselves, didn't foresee this. So I think something similar will happen here. Uh, I think this is way under, uh, we, we, we underestimate the dynamic. So we ask ourselves, well, if you look, if you step back and, and look at how would the development happen, what are the inflection points? We believe inflection point number one is that when the price of an electric vehicle is equal to the price of a combustion engine. So somebody goes in the shop, want to spend $25,000 for a new car, and he has a choice between a Ford Focus combustion engine or electric vehicle with four to 500 mile range, both at $25,000. We believe that the majority at that point will go for the, uh, for, for the uh, electric vehicle, since not only is it new, it's lower in maintenance, uh, it drives fast, it drives nicer, um, and uh, the fuel cost is lower. The next inflection point is then, well, today we're producing electric vehicles at a very low rate. What if we produce them at volume parity? So that Ford Focus, we produce at 2 million units, or Ford produces at 2 million units a year, combustion engine and electric vehicle. If you look at the bill of material, we believe the price of that car is about a third. If you look at the Tesla S, for instance, that has 17 moving parts in the drivetrain and in the engine compared to hundreds and hundreds of moving parts in a combustion engine. So you think that through, Bloomberg forecast price parity is gonna happen in 2022. That's the time when basically people, in my mind, start the vast majority to buy electric vehicles. That continues and uh, will reach volume parity at which point it's about a third of the price. What we believe will happen in between is people will realize Oh, and a car is now like a computer. It gets cheaper every year. So I, if I sell today my car, we're basically getting Blue Book. If I sell it in two years, we get Blue Book minus $5,000. If I sell it in five years, it's corrupt value. <laughs> so we believe, and this is, so obviously Bloomberg is a market resource and professionals, and this is just common sense, what you see here at, at the, at the uh, my common sense, and it might be wrong, but just looking at it, this feels more like what happened to a smartphone. This feels more what, what I believe uh, is, is really gonna happen on, on, on the electric vehicle. The other way to look at it is, we said, well, let's just look at it from a savings perspective. So we talked already, uh, you power all the 250 million cars with PV, it's about a trillion dollar. Now you need to calculate the fact that you have losses in the trans transmission system, in the distribution system, the utility want to do a margin, etc. You do the, the calculation on the dollar per mile basis. You save still about ninety billion dollar a year compared to the uh, uh, price at the gas pump in summer last year. Uh, so that to me is, is a, an important key learning from coming from you know uh, a power generation uh, industry. That basically means the electrification of transportation is a net saving to the consumer. But if you also assume that it's correct that at volume parity, the price of a new EV is only a third, the saving to the consumer in the US is gonna be 400 billion. You, you combine that, that it's, you have an electric vehicle self-driving in a shared model, like an Uber type model, the utilization rate of today's car is 4%. That means the second most important asset of any family stands around for 96%. If you can arrange that in Uber Time Island, you just assume that the, in, the utilization goes from 4% to 20%. It still stands around for 80% uh, percent of the time. Instead of 250 million cars, you need 50 million cars. You save another 150 billion. And then the status of all data points, we have about the, the cumulative damage that is done by car accidents and then 
you need to insure. Obviously, if you have a car, is is tremendous. We assume that 10% of or 90% of that you can avoid in in a regime where you where you simply have self-driving cars. And some of them would, would not agree with us, but we just assume that the computer is better than human being. And subsequently, you only need to pay 20% for the insurance. You add all that up. That's 1.5 trillion dollar, or 8% of the GDP of the United States. That's basically a stimulus package from 2008, twice every year. So that feels to me like an industry ready for disruption. Thank you very much. Thank you.